All right, we're going to start out this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to address a subject that's becoming more and more popular out there. Uh, and that is the question of, does the church need to be purified by the Great Tribulation? And more and more preachers and churches and Christians that used to hold to the pre-tribulation rapture, now they're starting to fall away. And they're starting to go into this thing that the church needs to be purified. So we're going to go through the tribulation. And I'm going to show you some very um, clear scriptures here that, that prove that uh, this teaching of pure, the church needing to be purified by God's wrath is a bunch of nonsense. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 it says here, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God. That's what uh, the Bible word for that is, repentance. That's what it means, you're turning to God. Uh, from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, you know, of course, the person who believes in a post-tribulation rapture will say, well, that's the wrath to come is hell. Well, that's certainly true, that it can be hell, but if you look at the context of First and Second Thessalonians, it's specifically talking about the rapture. Turn over to chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort to know that we are not going to have to face God's wrath along with the lost world. And that's what we're going to be discussing this morning, this teaching of what it means for the church to be purified and if people are going to have to go through the tribulation. Okay, And before I really get into this message, let me just say that, as I stated earlier, there are many Christians which are falling for this lie now that the church has to be purified by God's wrath. But it's also very popular among Catholics, Orthodox, and a lot of other cults. They love it. The Catholics especially. They like the idea of having to, to suffer and be purified. You see, if you, if you go to like the Philippines or some of these other countries where it's mostly Catholicism, uh, and the people are very radical Catholic there, they'll actually walk down the street with whips and whip their backs. And their backs are just blood. Blood going down over their pants, soaking into their pants. I've seen the video of it. It's disgusting. Why? Well, because they believe that their sufferings help to earn salvation. And there are guys that after they've whipped themselves and their backs are all ripped open, they'll put them on a cross and carry them around on a cross. And they think in their minds that they're helping to earn salvation. It's really disgusting. But see, that's the same kind of mentality that comes in here, that the church somehow, because we're bad and we have sin in us, we have to be, God has to pour his wrath out on us. And that's nonsense. It's not what the Bible teaches. But what does the Bible say about purity? The purity of a Christian. Titus chapter 2. We went over this in our Bible study this week. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 is where we're going to start out. It says here, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay, now I want to make a couple points there. Point number one, if you look there at verse 11, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Calvinism does not teach that. That's why Calvinism is ridiculous and you shouldn't fall for it. They teach that salvation only appears to the elect. That's nonsense. It appears to all men. 
and it's up to them to accept or reject of their own free will. God isn't going to force anybody to get saved. Okay, that's pretty ridiculous type of thinking. Okay, verse 12 talks about denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and how we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In other words, after you get saved comes sanctification. You deny ungodliness and worldliness and fleshly lusts and you begin to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Those things don't come before salvation, they come after it. Okay, if you're living, trying to live soberly, righteously, and godly without being saved, well, it's never going to work out. You're wasting your time. You need to be saved first. Okay, and then the third one there in verse 13, it says that you are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not looking for the Antichrist. You're not looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. You're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. It's right there. I don't know how you can get this stuff messed up. And of course, they'll say, well, yeah, but that's you're looking for it after the tribulation. No, you're looking for Jesus Christ to show up first. Uh, verse 14 there, you see it says that we are redeemed from all iniquity. All iniquity. Now, we're going to be coming back here to Titus chapter uh, 2, but right now we're going to go to 1 John chapter 1. Turn over to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If you want to keep your hand there in Titus chapter 2, we're going to be coming back there. Okay, it says here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Does that have to do with your salvation? No, it's talking about fellowship. Okay, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Now the hymn we sang this morning, which you didn't get to hear if you're listening online, we sang our the one hymn, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You are purified, made pure, first and foremost, by the blood of Jesus. Not by God's wrath. Not by God's judgment coming down on this world, on the lost world, for seven years. That doesn't make you pure. The thing that purifies you is the blood of Jesus Christ, and it cleanses you from all sin. Not from some sins, you know, from, it cleanses you from venial sins, but not mortal sins, you know, like the Catholic Church teaches. Well, actually, they don't teach that, you know, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from anything, actually. But the Bible teaches that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. Look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. Okay, the simple formula when you sin, and I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again, is confess it, forsake it, move forward. Just as simple as that. You're going to sin, you're going to mess up. But don't continue in it. Confess it to the Lord, say you messed up, forsake that sin, and then move forward. Don't dwell on it, no, I really messed up, and I'm never going to amount to anything. Don't do that. Confess it, forsake it, move forward. Get back in the fight again. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Just read the Bible sometime and you're going to see that you have sinned. Okay, this Bible has some pretty high standards in it. And, you know, if you want to look at your life and compare your life to something, don't compare it to other Christians. Okay, you can always find somebody that's doing worse than you. Compare it to this book, and you're going to see that you're a sinner. A sinner saved by grace. Turn back to Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Now, you see there in, for me, it's about the third line down. It says about, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So there is a purifying there. Okay? But what's it come from? It comes from your salvation. It does not come from you going through God's wrath. 
Okay, that's pretty ridiculous. And if you remember the verse we read there earlier, uh, it talked about that we are spared from the wrath to come. There in First Thessalonians chapter one verse ten is where it talks about that. But let me ask a question. There's a good point brought up at Bible study this past week, and that is, okay, if we have to be purified because we're not perfect, we're not spotless, we have to be purified. The church has to be purified in the tribulation. Um, what about the dead saints? The ones that have died and that are waiting for the resurrection? I guarantee you, many of us today are living more righteously and are more doctrinally correct than people in the past. I guarantee you. There have been Christians that have been saved. I'll give you a good example. Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther was is considered one of the great heroes of the faith, and I certainly consider him to be a saved man. But you look at some of the stuff he believed. He had some beliefs that were pretty far off. He had some areas where he was pretty messed up doctrinally. Now, I'm not saying that I'm more righteous and a stronger guy than, than Martin Luther was, but doctrinally, most of my doctrines are, are a lot better than Martin Luther. So why is it that I'm going to have to be purified by God's wrath, but he gets to escape it because he's dead and waiting for the Lord? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, and, and what, what you'll see too is you'll see these modern, you know, the, the, the churches where, that are doing this, teaching now that we have to be purified, they'll look at the modern apostate churches and they'll say, see, we have to be purified. That's not the standard. The modern churches are not part of the body of Christ many a times. We're going to see that as we continue on too. Uh, so let's continue here. Now the question is asked, which is a good question, who is the great tribulation really for? And I've covered this so many different times, I'm not going to get into it all here, but Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 is one that you need to know. It says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? Israel. Jacob is not the church. Let me ask you a question. The Jews right now in Israel, are they saved? No. They're God's chosen people, but they're not saved. If an Orthodox Jew that's living by the Torah, the first five books there, you know, in, in your Bible, they're living by the Torah and they're trying to keep the commandments and they're doing all their works. If they die today, they'll go to hell. God's chosen people and they're not saved. It's what the Bible teaches. Why? Well, because they reject Jesus Christ. They did not accept Jesus as their Messiah when he came the first time. So, what's the purpose of that coming seven-year time period? It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. It's to purify the Jews, not the church. Okay, the nation of Israel is the one that needs the purifying there. Not true Bible-believing Christians that are living right before the Lord. You know, we, we tend to look at the apostate church and, and get all upset about that, and we should, but that's not really the standard. There are a lot of Bible-believing Christians out there that are living right, that are fighting against the, the tide of wickedness that's coming across churches here in America. But let's talk about that. What is our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ? Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. People say, well, I don't know. I think that you know we need to have a little bit of persecution so we can be more spiritual and whatever else. And... You know, if it has to come from God. You know, and of course another thing, I'll say this quick before we continue. A lot of the one of the big attacks, one of the big arguments is they'll say, Well, what about the martyrs? Uh the martyrs were not persecuted by Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. The martyrs were not going through the Great Tribulation. They were going through tribulation, but it came from man, it came from the lost world. And you'll have that here. And we might have that before we get out. I don't know. But it says here, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now let me ask a question. Were the Old Testament saints in Christ Jesus? No. 
that's a special relationship that shows up only in the church age. Okay, the Old Testament saints were not in Christ Jesus. And again, I've covered this in other studies, and I won't, so I won't go over it in great detail here, but when Paul was persecuting Christians back when he was called Saul, Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, and he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus Christ equated Saul's attacking Christians with him actually attacking Jesus Christ. Now, we are members of the body of Christ, and we're going to see this here in just a minute or two. We are members of the body of Christ. So how can God pour out his wrath on the members of the body of Christ, on his own body? It doesn't make any sense. It's really quite a, a ridiculous thing there. But you say, yeah, but it says about there that uh, who walk not after the flesh. Okay? <clears throat> Right there, you'll say, well, you know, some people say these, uh, a lot of Christians are fleshly and carnal, so they need to be purified. But are they going to be purified by God's wrath? No. God's chastening, yeah, but not his wrath. That's crazy. But we'll continue here. Romans chapter 12. Turn over to Romans chapter 12, verse 4. We're going to see about this thing again of you being part of Christ's body. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. You are a member of the body of Christ. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Ephesians 5, 23 through 30. We're going to see again here the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Okay, it says here, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay. Uh, does it say that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the great tribulation? With the time of Jacob's trouble? No. You're sanctified and cleansed by reading your King James Bible. Look at verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. That is a very special, unique relationship which exists only in the church age. It doesn't exist in the tribulation, and it doesn't exist in the millennium. It exists for you today, and if you're listening to this message and you're lost and you're thinking, well, I'll wait for the rapture, then I can see proof. Uh, not a good idea. Okay, but notice there in verse 27, it says about that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And what does that come from? Verse 26, the washing of water by the word. That's how you will be sanctified. By knowing this book. That's how. Not by being persecuted. Okay, that's that's not a teaching that you're going to find much in Scripture. Now, the Bible does teach that we will be persecuted, but right there is how you're sanctified. That's how you are presented spotless before the Lord, by reading the Word of God. And there is a verse, which is also a good one that you should have memorized, Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? You cleanse your way by taking heed to the word of God. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Second Timothy 
Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and that every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let's see, where am I reading to? Okay, yeah, that's the, the one there. <clears throat> now, notice there in verse 22, it says that you're to flee youthful lusts. Now, what did it just say there in Psalm 119, verse 9? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You are purified by the word of God. Okay, First John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We're going to see a thing here. <clears throat> this is about the purifying hope of when Jesus Christ comes. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Okay. <coughs> now, a lot of these post-trib people get upset about this, but the fact of the matter is, when you are expecting Jesus Christ to show up at any time, it will make you want to live a pure life. Okay? He could come back today. Well, then I guess I better be pure. But if you're expecting Jesus Christ not to not show up till seven years after the Antichrist is revealed, and he won't show up till then, well, you have plenty of time to be purified. You just kind of wait. There will be signs that are going to come. Okay? And by the way, who seeks after a sign? The Jews. What's the tribulation going to be? It's going to be a confirmation of the book of Revelation. It's going to be used to confirm the whole New Testament. It's going to be seven years of signs and wonders. It's going to be amazing. It's not for the church. It's for Jacob, for Israel. But... Notice there in verse 3 it says, uh, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. Now that's very important to understand there. Let me ask you a question. When you sweat, do you expect God to clean you up? No. Whose responsibility is it? Yourself. <laughs> when you sin, do you expect God to clean you up? No. No. It's your own problem. It's your own issue. There is nobody that you can blame for your own sins. When you sin, it's your own problem, and you need to do something about it. Just as simple as that. And right there in verse 3, it says that you're to purify yourself. That's your responsibility as a Christian. You get saved. Now you're saved. You're a Christian. Now it's your job to purify yourself to clean up your life. God's not going to do it for you. The, the Holy Ghost will give you conviction about things that you weren't convicted about before, but it's your responsibility to purify your own life. That's the way it is. And to just, you know, well, I'll just live how I want to live, and then God will purify me by pouring out his wrath. I mean, it's just a, a really, sorry, but a really stupid way of, of looking at things. Okay, and... You say, well, well, God needs to purify the apostate church. No, he doesn't. God is going to destroy the apostate church. And we're going to see that. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And 
this is a very scary thing here, a very dangerous position to be in. Okay, and you don't want to get as far away from this as you can. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. It says here, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, what's the cause? They receive not the love of the truth. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know one of the main characteristics of some of these modern Christians? They don't love the truth. They'll get mad when you speak to them about the truth. They won't even listen. And you say, well, they're just carnal. They just, you know, eh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I was very carnal at one point in time. I would have been considered a modern Christian. But when I heard the truth, I changed. I got under conviction and I got right with the Lord. I didn't fight the Lord on it. I didn't say, no, I want to have pleasure in unrighteousness. I don't want to give up my sins. I don't want to give up my Hollywood movies or my rock music or my long hair or my worldly ways. I changed. I got right. But these people, oh, well, you know, I think I can continue just doing what the world does and I can be right with God and I don't want you telling me about it. And you want me to believe they're saved? Sorry, but I don't. Second Peter chapter 2. We're going to see an excellent description here of these people today that call themselves Christians. And yet there's the fruit is just not there. I mean, the Bible talks about they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. You're going to see that a lot. Second Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 says here, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring swift er, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, some people say, well, see, these people were saved, they were saved, and then they deny that the Lord bought them, and then they're destroyed and they lose their salvation. That's not what it says. Jesus Christ paid the price so that all men can be saved. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Okay? That salvation is available. But these people were never saved. And we're going to see that as we continue. And they're denying Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean that these people are atheists, by the way. A false prophet is not an atheist. They're in churches messing up people. They're bringing in damnable heresies. That's important to realize. These people are not... Outside of churches, they're in them. Okay, that's very important to get. Verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What's the most popular movement as far as Christian quote-unquote churches today? Is it the small King James Bible-believing militant churches? No. The big churches actually make fun of us. They speak evil of us. That song that we sang this morning, Nothing But the Blood, they won't even sing that kind of thing in the average church today. Why? It offends people to sing about the blood of Jesus. We ran into these two girls and they were out trying to sell magazines and, and Jesse and I, we were trying to witness to them and finally they got mad and stormed off and they said, thank you for wasting our time. But they're Christians, you see. Let me tell you something. A real true Christian that has the Holy Ghost within them is never going to say talking about Jesus is a waste of time. What were we dealing with there? We were dealing with false converts. They were speaking evil of us. They were upset because two Bible-believing Christians were rebuking them and reproving them, and they said, you're wasting our time. They spoke evil of us. Okay, Verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, feigned words means faked, they don't really mean it, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. These big church pastors, the Rick Warrens and the Joe Olsteins and some of these guys, they're getting rich. They're making lots of money. They're multi-millionaires. 
See, you can make a lot of money as a preacher if you learn how to play the game right. You're not going to make much money if you preach and speak the truth. Okay? God will bless you. God will do things for you. Yeah, sure. But you're not going to be a millionaire. You know, anybody who's a Christian and they're a millionaire from their preaching, look out. That's a dangerous thing to get to. Now jump down to verse 12. It says here, But these as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Remember what it said earlier there in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians? They receive not the love of the truth. <clears throat> they speak evil of the things that they understand not. You know, a lot of the people that attack the quote-unquote King James Only movement, they refuse to study it. They don't want to study it. They will not take literature from you. And there again, if you have somebody who's a professing Christian and they refuse to take, take tracts and they refuse to take books and they will not study the other side, you mean to tell me that they're saved? I don't believe that. Verse 13 2 Peter 2, verse 13 and 14 says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. You get around with apostate professing Christians at the holidays? Do they talk about spiritual things? No, they talk about Hollywood movies, about things of this world. Spots, they are. That's why Bible Believers Fellowship does not just allow anybody to come in. We want to talk to you before you can come here. Oh, that sounds bad. That sounds like a cult. It's not a cult. It's the Bible way. We're to be of the same mind, the same judgment, speaking the same thing. It's not, it's the right way you're supposed to do it. Okay, verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Are they God's children? <clears throat> no, they're cursed children. The Bible says that the wrath of God abideth on the children of disobedience. Don't tell me that because there's an apostate church out there, that the real true Christians are going to have to be persecuted by God along with them. That's nonsense. We might be persecuted by the world, but we're not going to be persecuted by God. And you read your Bible, go back to the book of Revelation, start in chapter 6 and start going through. It's Jesus Christ that's opening the seals. It's not man that's persecuting Christians. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that's opening those seals. Okay. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? Jump down to verse 17. Second Peter 2, verse 17. It says here, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried up with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Now notice something there. These are wells without water. What did we read earlier about the church being sanctified and cleansed? What was it that, that cleansed it? Washing of water by the word. You know what's interesting about a lot of these modern professing Christians? You come to them expecting to hear the pure word, the pure water of the word, and they're dry. They don't know the Bible. Okay, they don't study the Bible. They have no desire for this book. This book does not, this isn't where they get their truth from. They get their truth from their own feelings and their own impressions. What are they? They are wells without water. They don't have the living water of God's word within them. That's what they are. They're like a cloud that goes by and you need rain, you need the water, and the cloud just goes sailing on by and there's no water that comes out of it. And that's what these modern professing Christians are. <coughs> okay. And now let's go to... Verse 18. 2 Peter 2, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. They speak the words that come out of their own mind, not the words of God. 
Verse 19, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. <clears throat> now, you know, it's kind of interesting. We have a modern church, a very big, wicked modern church in this area, and it's called LCBC. You know what it stands for? Lives changed by Christ is what that thing's supposed to stand for. And yet, you look at the members of that thing, their lives aren't changed. They live just like the world. I wouldn't, I, we went there the one time I was getting some video and things. I wanted to get some video of the place, me and another member of the church here, and we were driving around the thing. There were girls walking into that thing. I couldn't believe that they'd be dressed like that going into a church. Oh, but their lives are changed by Christ. No, they're not. Their lives are not changed. They live just like the world. They look just like the lost world. And we've talked, <clears throat> we've talked to people, met them on the street that go to LCBC, they will get mad at you when you start telling them the truth. Their lives aren't changed. You know, there was a video we watched a while back, a year or two ago, where there was some big mega church somewhere, and they were singing Garth Brooks's one song, a country singer's song, I Got Friends in Low Places, where the whiskey drowns and the beer chases my blues away. And right after they're done singing it, a guy stands up and he goes, okay, put your hands together, we're going to worship Jesus now. See, they promised them liberty. Oh, you'll have a life changed by Christ. But they themselves are the servants of corruption. And I'll tell you right now, a lot of these people in these big mega churches, they are mental basket cases. They're depressed. They're on, you know, all kinds of things to get themselves out of depression. They're just running around trying to find happiness and joy. They don't have liberty that comes from Jesus Christ. They don't have peace. They don't have righteousness. They don't have joy in the Holy Ghost. They don't have it. But they're lying to people with feigned words to get them into the building so that they can get their money. They are exactly what's being described here in Second Peter chapter 3. And you say, well, maybe they're saved. They just don't know any better. Let's continue reading here. Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the salvation of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ... Does it say that? No. It says through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They escape because of the knowledge, but they aren't saved. You can know the right things to say. And it turned out, by the way, that these two girls that we were witnessing to that I mentioned earlier, it turned out it came out in the news that they're actually going around, them and others are going around and scamming people out of money. They were con artists. Oh, but they were Christians. Uh-huh. No, they had the knowledge. They knew the right things to say, sort of. I mean, we, we could see that they were fake. But to the average Christian, they would have, they would have deceived them. You know, <clears throat> they have the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It says here, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Why? Because they think they're saved. And they're not. Verse 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Holy Spirit inspired scripture. And it's sarcastic. You know how the Lord looks down on these modern professing Christians? says in Revelation chapter 3 that they're neither hot nor cold, they're lukewarm, and that God says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He compares them to vomit, and right there you have it. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, mud, and their own uh, waste material, I'll be politically correct there, their own waste material, mixed together, and the pigs there slopping around in that. That's how the Lord sees these modern professing Christians. That's what he thinks about them. Not a real nice picture. Okay, but now we're going to uh, end this study by looking at some different scriptures here. Turn back to Second Peter chapter 2, where we're in it, but turn back to verses 4 through 8. 
We're going to see how God always spares the righteous when he judges the earth. Okay, now what was the very, what was the very first time, or I should say when was the very first time that God judged the whole earth? The flood in the days of Noah. Yep. What chapter? Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is when it begins. Okay, and it goes through the next couple chapters describing it. But the purposes for it start in Genesis chapter 6. Okay, if you want to turn to that. We're not going to turn there this morning. But Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says here, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Okay, let me stop there for just a second. One of the reasons God destroyed the earth the first time was because of the sons of God, the angels. Genesis chapter 6, you can read about that. Okay? But he didn't spare the angels that sinned. Well then, I guess he just destroyed all the angels then, right? Wrong. He didn't spare the angels that sinned, but the angels that didn't sin, he did spare them. God isn't going to destroy all the angels because a few of them are bad. Don't be ridiculous. Verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of both the saved and the lost. Is that what it says? He brought the world, or he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. God is a judge, and he's not going to judge the righteous. A preacher of righteousness there, Noah, he spared him. Okay? God's not going to punish people that do not deserve it. Verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Have you ever been vexed by the conversation, the filthy conversation of this world? Yep. It doesn't mean that you yourself are the one that's doing the filthy conversation. You better not be. But the fact is, it gets so bad at when God's judgment is about to be poured out that the lost world is so wicked that it's vexing to even be around them as a Christian. As a saved person, I should say, as a saved man or woman. And that's what Lot was going through. And read about Lot, by the way. Some of the things he did, were, we wouldn't consider to be very righteous. And yet God spared him. God went down and sent two angels in and got him out of there before God's wrath was poured out. But it's somehow different today. When we are members of the body of Christ, we are in Christ. Lot wasn't. And yet God spared Lot before his judgment was poured out. But these Christians want us to believe that we're not going to be spared from the tribulation. It doesn't make any sense. God would be doing something that he never did before in history. It'd be very ridiculous. Okay, look at verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Notice the distinction between the saved and the lost. Godly versus unjust. Okay, uncleanness versus purity. It's not the same thing. Now we're going to go back to the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 18. Just a few more places to turn to before we're done here. Genesis chapter 18. We're going to look at one of the stories that we just read about there. I will not get to it yet. Okay, Genesis chapter 18, verse 23. And here you have God speaking with Abraham about the destruction, the coming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says here, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, 
and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And what's God's answer? Does God say, well, sorry, Lot, they're just, they made me mad, so I'm just going to destroy them all at once. You know, Lot needs to be purified. No, he says here, verse 26, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Now, I've been over this many times before, but why has God spared America up to this point? Because there's more than 50 righteous. There's a lot of righteous here in America. Praise God for that. And we should try to preserve that. We shouldn't say, well, I really would love to see God's persecution come down. No, you don't want that. Okay, we should be thankful for what we have. And we should work as hard as we can to get the gospel out to other people and pray that God preserves the situation here in America, keeps us out of the prisons, keeps us out of detention camps and whatever else. We should pray that God preserves it so that we can get answers to people in other countries. Okay? And we should be fighting for that. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, actually, is where we're going to start. And here you have the Jews are in captivity. They're in Egypt. And Moses is trying to get them out of there, with the Lord's help, of course. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. Uh, when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now there's a whole lot of things I could say here about the Passover, but the whole point is, God spared the Old Testament Jews because he saw the blood. Now, if God did that for the Jews who were in Egypt when he came to judge Egypt, why wouldn't he do it for us today? When we actually have, it's not the blood of some animal, it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's blood that he purchased the church with. But God's going to pour out his wrath on us? doesn't make any sense. This teaching of a post-tribulation rapture that the body of Christ has to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, it is anti-scriptural and it is very dangerous. It's a very wicked teaching. And I'll tell you what, I am just radically opposed to it. Okay, now there are, of course, many, many times you read through the Old Testament, there are many times when God's wrath, when God's judgment came, and it was always separate the good ones, the ones that are doing right, Separate them out, and now my wrath comes. That's how it always was. But we're going to go up, up to Ezekiel. This will be the last place we turn to, Ezekiel chapter 8. Because there's a lot of similarities here between what's going on and what's going on today. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 5. <clears throat> and you're going to see another uh, excellent thing here in instruction and in righteousness where the ancient Jews, uh, they were doing really good. Israel as a nation was a very godly nation. They feared the Lord for a long time, under the rule of King David especially. But as time went by, they started to bring in some of the pagan gods and some of the pagan ways of the people around them. And here's when it's really, really getting bad. And we're going to see a lot of this lines up with today. America was a very godly nation and feared the Lord. We had the King James Bible in all the churches. And then we began to bring in the new versions and we began to bring in the lost and they began to bring in their pagan ways. And we're going to see some interesting parallels here. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 5. Okay, This is the Lord taking Ezekiel around showing him what's going on in Jerusalem. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes from the way toward the north and behold, northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see 
greater abominations. You know what happens when you bring abominations into a place where you worship the Lord? God says, I'm going to leave that place. I'm going to go far off. Okay? That's why Revelation chapter 3, the church of the Laodiceans, it ends with, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him. And, you know, the Lord's on the outside of the church knocking. And you have to get out of the popular Laodicean type of church to have fellowship with the Lord. Okay? Uh, go to verse 7. Ezekiel 8, verse 7. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they, for they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath, hath forsaken the earth. You say, what's the parallel here? Well, look at a lot of these modern churches. Are they bright inside? No. A lot of them are black. And they're dark. LCBC that I talked about earlier, the sanctuary is black. Totally dark. And if you go to that place, I've seen video, I wouldn't step foot in that place, but if you go to it and you look at the videos... It's totally dark. You can't even see the people out in the congregation. And up on the stage, they got the rock band playing with laser lights shining on them. Looks like a nightclub. And I've seen it. A, a guy sent me a video. A brother sent me a video. And, he, and I did not know it was a church until the band stopped playing. Literally. I, it, it looked like a heavy metal. It was a heavy metal band. It looked like a nightclub. It was totally black. Totally dark. And lights going and the guys up there singing and, and moshing, you know, making their hair go and stuff. And people screaming and, and stage diving and stuff. And they got done and they said, all right, you know, praise the Lord. And I thought, what? It was a church. Oh, the Lord's forsaken the earth. We got to do things the way, you know, the, the world does to draw in the world. And Uh-huh. Give you another example. What about movie theaters? You know, there's a lot of Christians that have no problem at all going to Hollywood movies. And seeing every abomination and wickedness, and they don't even feel convicted about it. And it gets even worse. There are modern churches in this country that play Hollywood movies. And now you have a lot of ministries, quote unquote, that are actually getting money together to start producing movies for Hollywood theaters. You say, what's going on? Oh, pretty much the same thing that was going on back there in Ezekiel's day. Same thing. Taking up heathen ways and heathen practices and calling it church. Look at verse 13. Verses 13 and 14. It says here, He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now that's a very interesting thing there. And I can't get into all this whole study, but way back after the flood in the days of Noah, there was a man that was born, and his name was Nimrod. Nimrod was the head of Babylon, ancient Babylon. And they were the ones that came up with a lot of the witchcraft practices and a lot of occultism. And his mother was named Semiramis. And they had a child named Tammuz. Now, Nimrod was a mighty hunter, and you read about that. Tammuz, not so much so. <laughs> he was a little weak, little wimpy guy, and he wanted to be like his father, and he went out to kill a wild boar, according to the tradition, and he didn't make it. <laughs> the wild boar killed Tammuz. Okay? And this wicked Semiramis, she said, 
why well, you know this is, doesn't look too good for me you know i got to retain my status here as the queen so she said well my my son tamas you know he was killed by this wild boar but he's actually being been reincarnated and he's now the son and they instituted the the system of sun worship baal worship and every year they weep they would weep for tamas because they'd weep on the day that he was killed by this wild boar and there's a lot more to it i could get into but that's what's going on there the ancient pa pagan babylonian system being practiced by the jews okay and it's still practiced today by the way too you say what is it it's called easter all right now you don't weep for tamas you know but a lot of people they do some of this stuff okay don't want to get into a whole big thing there look at verse 15 as we continue here Ezekiel chapter not or chapter eight verse fifteen says, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee, thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and look at this, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. They they were bringing the pagan Babylonian system of Baal worship into the church. Okay? And you say, well, give me a modern day example. Did you ever see the Catholic priest elevate the host? That's the system of Baal. Okay? It's a round disc. It's meant to symbolize the sun. And that priest, he holds it and he slowly goes like that and raises it up and the people are supposed to worship it. What he's doing is he's symbolizing the sun. And they have a thing called a monstrance, which they put it in. It's a big gold or silver thing, and it has rays coming out to look like the sun. And the people worship it. You go to a country that's, that's predominantly Catholic, and the priest will carry this monstrance thing down the streets, and you'll see people bowing down to it. What's going on? It's the ancient pagan system of Baal worship. And you say, well, how does that uh, relate to the Christian church? You know, that is sure, okay, the Catholics. Well, guess what? It's now a popular thing to do what's called pulpit swapping. And they have Catholic priests coming into the to Christian, quote-unquote, churches. Methodists especially like to do this stuff. And they have Catholic priests come in and giving and doing the Eucharist celebration for Christians. Or professing Christians, I should say. They're bringing it into the churches. Yeah. Pretty disgusting. Okay. Uh, look at verse 17 and 18. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though the, they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Oh boy, it sounds like God's going to judge everybody. It just sounds like God's going to come in and wipe them all out, right? Wrong. Let's keep reading. Ezekiel chapter 9 <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 1 down through 7. It says here, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Calls them that have charge over the city to draw near every, excuse me, even every man with his own destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. Been pretty interesting to see that. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Let me just stop for a second there. Isn't that kind of interesting? God sets a mark upon the foreheads of the men that are upset by what's going on in Jerusalem. 
Why? Well, we're going to see why. But basically, he spares them. So even in this wicked time, God goes through and he says, okay, the men that are upset about what's going on, spare them, but kill everybody else. God always spares the righteous when it comes time for judgment. But you say, well, that's kind of weird there that God would set a mark upon their foreheads. Doesn't the Antichrist do that? Yeah. But where do you think he got the idea from? Okay. And by the way, Revelation chapter 7, God seals the 144,000 Jews with a mark, okay, in their foreheads. And then the Antichrist, Revelation chapter 13, he copies and he puts a mark upon the foreheads of the lost world. Okay, Satan always imitates God. Okay, don't, so it's not a bad thing what's going on here. Okay, uh, verse 5. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. How's that? Imagine that. Let's finish up here, then I'll get back to that. Then they began at the ancient man, men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Hmm. When judgment came, God didn't say, Go on down to the, the shopping mall, go down to the movie theater, go down to the bars, go down to the uh, strip clubs, or go down to the, you know, evil place he said start at my sanctuary start at my house that's where you're going to go and start slaying people and that's something you say well that's just old testament really first peter chapter 4 verse 17 says for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of god and if it first begin at us what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of god pretty interesting god's judgment on this nation is going to begin at the house of God. And you say, well, then that means we're going to go through the tribulation. No, I think that the judgment's going to be the real judgment of what happened here, where God separates the saved and the apostate. Where God says, you're really saved, you're really upset by what's going on in this world, you're sanctified, you're purifying your life, you are definitely saved, you're a Christian, you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm going to separate you from this wicked world. And he looks at these people, the wells without water, the false prophets that speak evil of the true Christians, and he's going to say, you, depart from me. I never knew you. You were never saved. You were never redeemed. That's going to be the judgment. Okay, and it's going to be a very bad judgment. And the Bible says that God's going to send them strong delusion because they received not the love of the truth. And they, that they might be damned too, by the way. Okay, one more place. We're going to read just a few more verses and then we're done. Ezekiel chapter 44. We're going to see something very interesting here. We're going to read verses 4 through 8. Ezekiel chapter 44. And, you know, you can learn a lot of things from the Old Testament. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. The things that happened to the Jews... You know, this isn't happening, this stuff isn't happening to our ancestors. Our ancestors are not Jewish. You know, most of you listening to this, probably your ancestors are from Japheth. Some of you may be from Ham, some from Shem. But most of us, you know, we're, our ancestors were the heathen in the Old Testament. But we can certainly learn from the nation of Israel from their mistakes. But it says here, Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 5, and the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering in of the house with every going forth of the sanctuary. Okay? Uh, he says there that you're to mark well those things that are going on in the presence of the Lord, basically. And I do believe in reverence when you get together. When the body of Christ is together. I don't believe it should be a free-for-all or a flesh show or anything else. You know, a flesh show being a carnival. <laughs> uh, again, I'm not going to get into that. But the fact is, saved people, there should be reverence among the body of Christ. 
Okay, it, it should be different than the gathering of the lost out there. Verse 6, look at verse 6. And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even of the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart, and uncircumcised in flesh. The Bible talks about the circumcision made without hands and in your New Testament. It says here, To be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. And that's where we're going to end it this morning. The movement of the modern church system of bringing in unchurched people and making church conform to their standards is exactly what was going on back there in the Old Testament. It's exactly why God destroyed the nation of Israel. Okay, And God is going to destroy this nation too. America is going to be destroyed. America is not going to last. It's just the way it is. And you say, well, then judgment's going to come. We're going to be purified. The church is going to go through the tribulation. Uh-uh. The judgment that's coming is the rapture. See, a lot of these post-trib people, they think that the rapture is kind of a cop-out. And I actually have a, a message on the post-trib rapture thieves. I think it's part three, where a Greek Orthodox priest says that the rapture is a cop-out. He actually says it. See, they think that it's taught so that we can get out of persecution. That isn't it. We are getting out of God's wrath. Why? Well, because we're just. If you're a Bible-believing Christian and you're doing right and you're living right for the Lord and you're purifying yourself, getting your sins under the blood, forsaking sins, confessing sins, moving forward, if you're doing that, God's not going to pour out His judgment and His wrath on you. Okay? He's going to spare you from it. But that judgment that's going to happen at the rapture, and the rapture is a judgment. It's not a cop-out. It's not a, I'm getting out of here before you know, trouble or whatever. It is a judgment when God is going to separate the saved from the lost. And the lost that are left here, the big modern church type Christians, they already can't stand us. They already talk about your Bible and your music and your ways. They're already separating from us. They already refuse to have anything to do with us. Uh, one of my brethren down in Texas, he sends out free Bibles and free materials. And he sent a free Bible and a copy of my one video to a guy in New Zealand. And the guy said in New Zealand, we are the only Bible-believing church in all of New Zealand, in this whole area. And he said, we cannot get King James only type materials. We can't get videos. We can't get books because the bookstores here in New Zealand refuse to sell them. And guess what? Most bookstores, Christian quote unquote bookstores in America refuse to sell Bible believing materials. They won't sell them. They'll sell Catholic books. They'll sell New Age books. But they won't sell Bible-believing Christian books. Why? Because we're not part of the same church. They receive not the love of the truth. They speak evil of the things that they understand not. They speak evil of the right way. And God's judgment that's coming is the pre-tribulation rapture. And we need to start thinking of it as a judgment, not as a good, happy time. It's going to be a judgment. And those modern professing Christians that have a knowledge of Jesus Christ, when the rapture hits, most of them, because when the Antichrist shows up, I think he's going to look just like what people think Jesus Christ looks like. And most of them are going to think, Jesus just showed up, and we're going to worship him. And they're going to be damned. They're going to receive the strong delusion. The strong delusion is going to be the Antichrist. Read the context of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The man of sin is revealed, and then it talks about the strong delusion. I mean, just think what the average modern Christian that doesn't know their Bible, their wells without water, think of what they believe Jesus Christ looks like, 
And then all of a sudden that guy shows up. You think that they're not going to worship him? You better believe they're going to worship him. That's bad. That's a judgment that's coming. So that's going to be it for this study. Do not fall for this thing that the church needs to be purified somehow by God's wrath. Okay? Purification is your responsibility as a Christian. You need to stay in the book. You need to pray. You need to witness. You need to cleanse yourself from ungodliness. Don't walk in the course of the world. Flee youthful lusts. Cleanse your way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's your responsibility as a Christian. Sanctification is your job, not the Lord's. Okay, so that's it for this morning. Thank you very much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.